Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sit through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. And today we're going to be talking about... The gaze and identity, and this is kind of a continuation of, it was, uh, what, two sessions back that we were talking about the Sartrean gaze, and then we strayed over into the male gaze and the panopticon, and I think we started speculating about the internet and uh, the surveillance society and all sorts of other things, and we wanted, there was a lot of stuff we didn't actually get to that we wanted to hash out, so this is take two. Right, but there's some some new stuff as well that we have lined up for you. So, how did you conceive of this, Dan? What, what was your idea for the next show on the gaze? Um. Well, we you know obviously ended up with some extra material, but I also was really interested in how um, the gaze not only creates this idea of um, being an object in other subjects perception, but also um, how being an object in someone else's perception uh, helps to create one's own identity. And so that's the, the, the kind of the, the jumping off point here is uh, this, you know, uh, are you part of this group is, is the, the gaze that the Sartrean gaze we're talking about um, a prerequisite for you to um, have some sort of identity within a group and is that a good or a bad thing? Does it, I mean, does it also involve identity? We, we talk about group identity, membership, right? But then mm-hmm. there's identity the way that we conceive of ourselves, whether we're in a group or outside of a group, transferring from one situation to another where we may be dealing with different groups and people carry their identity with them. Now, granted, a lot of that is group identity. Like, you know, back in, mm-hmm. in, in my days, it mattered a lot whether you were uh, a metalhead or a jock or, you know, into punk or stuff like that. And that was, you know, there was a lot of like being nonconformists all together in the same <laughs> way, right? So, which, which the hippies also perfected way, you know, a whole generation before that. Um, and so you could say some of that's group identity, right? But, but right. there is also an individual side to it, too, isn't there? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And the question is, how much do you want to be giving up in order to actually be accepted within these groups? And so there's uh, this tension between what one defines as their own identity and then what one defines as their group identity and how much one will subsume their uh, individual identity uh, into a group identity to gain recognition from that group. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's kind of funny in that you can – I mean, you, you can see some groups, if they're very, very small, as a totality. Like you can line up a, a bunch of friends and take a, a picture of them and, you know, that can be like the glory days and you can say, oh, look at look at all five of us or all ten of us or whatever. But you get, you get much larger than that and so much of group identity is essentially imaginary. Right. Like if you and I were to think, okay, so one, one group that we're involved with, you and I are both co-organizers of the Milwaukee Stoic Fellowship. And if you look at the meetup uh, site for that, there's like 500 people in the group. Now, right. granted, they don't all show up. I mean, thank God they don't because otherwise it would be pandemonium. <laughs> but we, if we think about like that particular identifier, um, Stoic, and you try to think about – how many people there are worldwide within some sort of loose movement, um, you you can't picture it, right? And so what does it mean to belong to that? It's always us projecting something out there onto this group and in return, all of us like internalizing something that we think the group is telling us, but but who's the group? You know, it's it's not like there's a 
uh, voice of the group or a spokesperson who reveals all of this stuff to us. And I think you can say that about any community, especially ones that have like a long tradition to them. You know, like if you think about um, religious communities or political movements or I don't know, artistic movements or things like that, you know, if they've got a couple generations to them and maybe one of the generations or more are dead already, um, you know, like think about existentialism. It, it, how, how, you know, if I say I'm an existentialist, you know, the next thing you can ask me is, well, what kind of existentialist are you? How are you modeling yourself after it? What do you understand this to be? And a lot of times when, when you ask somebody those questions, um, they have kind of just a hazy idea. So, <laughs> you know, how much, how much of that really is a group identity and how much is like their own reinterpretation of, of that identity? Well, what do you think? Uh, I guess the first question I have to ask is like, are you more, uh, what, Sartre, Camus, or, uh, Kierkegaard? Oh, maybe we're going back to, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, or, or, you know, there's a number of contemporary existentialist writers as well. And so you can kind of go into each one of those. And yeah, I don't know, th this is kind of a, a question that many groups go through. Like, are they going to be kind of a wide net? Are they going to try to create some sort of, you know, purity testing? And obvi obviously, if you, you know, once again take a, a religious community and we've seen, you know, throughout the centuries that uh there's often times that are schisms and you know oh, what yeah. are we going to define ourselves and now well now we don't agree with what those guys got and so we can't be called the same thing anymore so we had to give us a new name based on some other criterion that's true yeah you know one of the things i used to teach a lot of religious studies classes so i did a lot of research into particular denominations and one one thing that that um, the scholars who like, you know, do this full time, because I was just, you know, sort of an amateur to intermediate level. One of the things that they kept calling attention to was that religious organizations that require a lot from their membership, a lot of things that might be painful or, you know, they have to sacrifice something or deprioritize something. Um, those are the ones that tend to retain their membership more, even though they're losing some who are like, ah, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they were the ones that like in the 2000s, when I was really looking into this stuff, they, those were the ones that were growing and they were mostly fairly conservative groups. And then the ones that were much more, oh, you know, big tent, we can all get along together. Mm -hmm. They were like just hemorrhaging membership. Because people would be like, well, I don't really know what we stand for. And, um, you know, if I wanted just a, a political uh, message, I could go to a rally instead. Or if I just wanted to, you know, sing nice songs, I could go and do that with, with other people, you know. Um, it's interesting that if there isn't some sort of – something demanded, something mm -hmm. required – um, the identity starts to break down and disappear. Wait. Yeah. It I, seems I, like, um, I don't know that like that's really there's the, some skin in the game type yeah, idea. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I don't know if that's really the case for like internet communities. Um, maybe those are exceptions to it or, or fandoms, right? Um, maybe that's, that's not quite the same thing as a political movement or a religious organization. Um, you know, yeah, I can see how uh, it's it's hard because those, you know, once again they are a group, but they also have that issue of the lack of of something sacrificed. You know, uh, yeah, and and I've seen the same studies about those that uh, you know require something are the ones that are most lasting. So the question is like. Um, is I don't know. Is it is it good? <laughs> I'm not sure. But I mean, regardless, I kinda, yeah, I kind of think that like I was with, gonna... with fandoms, it's um, it's a different dynamic at play. It's more like who's who's the more committed fan and who knows the most about the the base of the whatever it happens to be. You know, whether mm -hmm. it's you know um, putting together Legos or. I don't know. Uh, oh, if you're on, or, 
in, if you're in a, a fandom that has lots of uh, cosplay, who has spent the most time right. to making the most elaborate things, that gives you the most clout. And I guess there, that's definitely something uh, costly to d- produce. But they can be really picky in relation to each other. Like you could have made a really, really great costume and there'll be some person there to tell you how you got this detail wrong, you know? In addition yeah. to the many other people who are like, oh, man, this is so cool. You know, I'm glad that you're doing this. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's as if there's a lot of uh, ranking and, and, and gatekeeping. And I suppose you could say you have that in political organizations. Who's willing to man the phones? You know, who's the really committed person or religious organizations? You know, who's embodying the ideals of whatever – thing it happens to be who's meditating the longest who's who's going to church most often you know um Mm -hmm. so i guess maybe there's there's some similarities there yeah so actually before you get too deep into this i thought we would (laughs) um do a real quick um refresher of the gaze yeah this 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 central concept for sart right Mm -hmm. um yeah i think we're gonna have to do some work to connect that to group identity because Sartre talks mostly about individuals in relation to other individuals. It can be called the gaze or the look. In French, it's le regard. And he says that it's not, it's not reducible just to like our eyeballs looking at somebody else. So he's got the example of um, a farmhouse when, when you're at war. And actually, this, the book that he's, talk, he's bringing this up in is written during World War II. Um, there's a farmhouse and there could be enemy soldiers up there that are going to shoot at you. Even if they're not there, there's still this phenomenon of like being in somebody else's look or gaze. And I think there's a, there's a lot of things like that for many of us. Maybe sometimes if, if we were brought up in a religious, um, family or household or community we think God is looking at us all the time or, or maybe, you know, when we're kids, we think Santa or the, you know, the tooth fairy or whoever else. And we better not, you know, we better not do the wrong thing. Um, the elf on the shelf thing, by the way, you know, that's kind yeah. of a, that's a, that's a gaze inducer, isn't it? Right. This, this right. elf is supposed that's- to be staring at you and he's checking up on you. I, I think it's kind of a jerk move to have an oh, elf yeah, on the shelf. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that seems, you know, like you're creating a little panopticon in your child's room. Yeah. Uh, but um, I was actually just, uh, coming up with uh, an example of this and like if you're i don't know um in the kitchen and you're cheating on your like diet and you know that other people <laughs> know that you're trying to be on this diet yeah so you're sneaking um, things and yeah you're sneaking you're sneaking a cookie or something or a okay. slice of cake and, and if someone walks in then you have this immediate feeling of like potentially shame <laughs> but on the other hand if like the Roomba drives into the kitchen you 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 have no worry about it. It's, it's just a Roomba. There's no subjectivity in that Roomba, even though it is moving throughout your house independently. Yeah. Although if you if you don't know that it's the Roomba, right? You just hear like, oh. a, like a sound, a creak, or something yeah. like that. I mean, that's what that's that's the way to change um, uh, the different things that are making the sounds. Like when we have these jump scares with cats and horror movies, right? We, we don't know that it's, it's not the monster or the crazy person or wh- whoever the, the, the prota- the antagonist is and mm-hmm. a cat jumps out and we, you know, at first don't know what it is and we react to it as if it's a monster and then, Oh no, it's just a cat, you know? And then, you know, yeah. the really smart movies have the monster come like almost immediately after that. But, but yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly what's, what Sartre is talking about. We don't know until we encounter it, whether it really is a gaze or not. And the, mm-hmm. you could say the disposition to, to react as if we're being gazed at precedes actually being looked at in a lot of cases, or, or maybe we're never actually being looked at in some cases. And that's cases. the reason for the, the panopticon is just the the implication that there might be a gaze is yeah, all you need yeah. to have the feeling of the gaze upon you. Yeah, that's and so the panopticon was this prison idea, although it could be applied to like hospitals and other things, where you would never know whether you're being watched or not. So you would you would feel as if you're being watched, and then the idea was you'd be on your best behavior, which doesn't actually turn out to be the case. 
with real live human beings. Some people get just very paranoid and, you know, may, may do things that the panopticon designers didn't want them to do as a result. Some people become kind of despairing. Other people are like, well, hell, if you're going to look at me, go ahead and look. I'm going to do whatever I want to. You know, they get, get undressed or start, you know, doing all sorts of other things. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I've had the experience of um, a, a friend of the family let me use their tool shop, and I'm usually really good with uh, like tools. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like fumbling things in front of this person who's like making sure that I'm like competent to use his tools because of the fact that I'm like You're being, being at, right? judged yeah. and looked at. Yeah, and so. Yeah, there's a lot of people that, that, whose performances suffer when they're 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 good at what they do, right? They're knowledgeable, mm-hmm. they have competence, but just being watched can somehow induce this this uh what would you call it? Like uh, you know, uh, performance anxiety? I guess, yeah, but I it's, don't know. it's uh, a self-fulfilling performance anxiety, right? Because right. you, you're worried about how you're going to perform and that makes you less able to perform. And then you factually screw things up, you know? I, I mean, I have right. students who have a similar dynamic where they have test anxiety and they worry about whether their test anxiety is going to strike them. And, you know, if it does, then it's going to be a catastrophe and they get so worried about whether it's going to happen that they make it happen. So this is a, what, meta meta test anxiety at this point in time? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because usually we think of like meta as being above and, you know, the other thing is being below, but they kind of like – there's an interplay between them. I mean, similar things can happen when you go on a first date with somebody and you're like, oh, I don't want to be nervous. Um, <laughs> well, that's definitely going to make you nervous. <laughs> yeah. Now you're thinking about being nervous. Exactly. Uh, you know, um, I mean, when we first went on the radio – um did were you nervous about like getting up in front of the mic and stuff like that i know i was i I was a little bit extra nervous because i also had to run the control board and so it was like trying to think about what we're talking about keep that conversation as well as use this you know piece of machinery that i'm not super well versed in i've had some experience with it but like it's still new and it's all live on air and you've got to like <laughs> do it now <laughs> yeah live on air and also recorded right right uh, if it's just totally live on air um maybe there's not as much pressure because it's just going to disappear once once you've finished mm-hmm. with it um but if you know that it's being recorded somewhere then I don't know, maybe that increases the anxiety or the nervousness. Yeah, I guess I wasn't thinking about that. But the next time that we do it live, <laughs> I'll be thinking about it. Thanks, Greg. Well, you'll, maybe I need to learn how to do the board. So, you know, we'll swap back and forth. Well, let, let's come back to, to Sartre. So, um, yeah, he, he actually has this really famous set of passages where he's talking about something. And I think for pe- people who are listening who are like, what, what are these guys talking about? This might actually be quite helpful. And so he says, let us imagine that moved by jealousy, curiosity, or vice, I've glued my ear to the door and looked through a keyhole. So he's, he's like checking in on somebody else. He's looking at somebody else. And he says, behind that door, there's a spectacle presented as to be seen, a conversation as to be heard. The door, the keyhole are at once both instruments and obstacles. They are presented as to be handled with care. The keyhole is given as to be looked through close by and a little to one side so i'm i'm like totally concentrating on this you know i, I want to check up on on somebody you know and it could be like you know you're trying to see somebody get undressed or it could be like there's there's an argument about to happen or may i don't know maybe you're a spy or something and you're, mm-hmm. you're checking on somebody and so he says all of a sudden I hear footsteps in the hall. Somebody is looking at me. What does this mean? It means that I am suddenly affected in my being and that essential modifications appear in my structure. First of all, I now exist as myself for my unreflective consciousness. It is this eruption of the self which has been most described. I see myself 
because somebody sees me as it is usually expressed. So when somebody suddenly puts, you know, I'm, I'm sort of in the driver's seat. I'm the gazer. I'm the looker. And then when somebody is seeing me now, suddenly, you know, I'm being looked at too. And that's not quite so comfortable, especially maybe, you know, if I, if I am looking at them out of jealousy, curiosity or vice, they get to see me and interpret me as jealous, curious, vicious, whatever it happens to be. And regardless of your intention, looking through that keyhole, either through, you know, uh, nefarious reasons or like perfectly mundane, like, I don't know, I haven't heard from this person for two days and I want to see if they're alive or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but regardless of that, you automatically are now positioning yourself and looking at yourself as the object of someone else's subjective perception, and they don't know your intentions, and so now you say, like, well, they see me as, like, a peeping Tom, um, most likely because that's what it looks like, even though it not <laughs> might not be what it is at all. Yeah, I mean, some people get very defensive in advance, you know, that this isn't what it appears to be, right? That's like mm-hmm. the, the, the neutral line. And then they're like, who are you to be looking at me when, when I'm doing this sort of thing? <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting. Peepholes, they could be all sorts of things. Um, it could be looking at somebody else, you know, through a window, or it could be looking at them um, through some digital means, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and then the other thing, I mean, I, when I, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the internet scam that's been going around lately and taking in a lot of people where they'll, somebody, I don't, I don't know who it is, but you know, some scammers will send a message to you that says, um, we've been looking at you through your, your uh, camera camera right and mm-hmm. we've we've also seen the sites that you're looking at mm-hmm. and we're going to like send pictures of you and the the sites that you're looking at uh, presumably porn right because it's not like well i've been looking at bubblegum.com or you know yeah. uh, things about my stock portfolio motorcycle parts yeah um i think it's it's probably always i mean if it and if it's not porn it's it's probably something you know much worse mm-hmm. because you notice that there's uh, uh, there's funny things where somebody will say what are what are you actually looking at oh it's it's porn because they don't want somebody to know that, <laughs> if, that it's it's something that, that would be even more humiliating and embarrassing for them um, right but but this idea is they they say to people you you know we've got you on on camera essentially and then people send them money you know and mm-hmm. why would they do that because they they assume that they are in fact being looked at and and it's all like um it's all a bluff it's it's all bravado they haven't hacked your computer um they're just fishing to see whether you know one out of 100 people will will send them some cards or bitcoin or whatever it happens to be the currency that they're they're looking for yeah um, they're they're just Assuming that that gaze and the the worry from what could be seen is great enough to in, induce them to some action, right? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I think Sartre really is on to something here in this this discussion of this this phenomenon. Um, so, um, and so springboarding from that, I'm um, kind of like bringing into this idea of. Um, identity uh, a little bit as mm-hmm. a you know what are we when we are seen by others uh, is our identity kind of like self derived or is it uh, something that is derived from how others see us and so this is now this you know are we seen as an object or a subject by other subjects and how much do we care about that and I guess uh, we've been talking about it, it seems that we very much care how we are seen um, in all sorts of uh, manners. Yeah. And here we have uh, the basis for our identity, or at least a potential candidate basis for identity. Yeah, and I think we should talk a little bit about what it means to be seen as a subject or being seen as an object, because I think some people might might not catch on to that right away. Um, mm-hmm. To be seen as a subject is to be seen as somebody – 
who has agency, who can who can decide things, who can direct their own gaze to to things, who is not merely determined by say their environment or their own um, desires, right? They they can make choices <laughs> and. They, there's also a kind of dignity that goes with it. If I treat you as a subject as, as opposed to an object, I'm treating you as if you have legitimate um, values and desires of your own, which might not be the same as mine, but which either have to be contested or respected. Even if I'm contesting them, I'm still treating you as a subject, not just as an object. With an object, you just, you know, make it do the things that you want it to do or you dispose of it how you want. And this is where we get to a lot of uh, interesting dynamics where a person, you know, they, they want the other person to both be an object and a subject for them at the same time. You know, when you think about like um, – crazy demands that people put on other people in terms of romantic relationships you know they they want the other person to in a certain sense be passive or predictable and on the other hand if they if they are that way then they can't get what they're really looking for from the other person you know and this is where we get into talk about recognition and yeah. and that that interesting concept and, and dynamic. But, you know, we can also say similarly, going back to this group thing, like, you know, when when you're looked at as an object, you can be looked at as just a, as a member, as a representative member of a group. So like stereotyping is treating a person as an object, you know, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to, to a subject, right? A, a subject would be able to do something different than what what the stereotype would predict. And, and, you know, we, we do rely, I mean, some of the times people act like stereotypes, um, and, um, stereotypes are helpful for figuring out how to make it around the world. But if we're, if we're constantly stereotyping people, we inhabit a world that has very few subjects and mostly just objects, you know? I mean, it, it can also be helpful to think too about like what, what else we consider objects. Um, so our technology, you know, uh, virtual personal assistants like Siri or Cortada, they're ultimately just objects. You know, I mean, unless somebody like falls in love with Siri, <laughs> <laughs> starts caring about, you know, Siri's welfare and stuff like that. Ooh, if I do another update, is is this going to hurt Siri or something like that? Then I guess that could be treating Siri as a subject, although Siri isn't a subject. Siri is just a, a code, right? Um, right. Uh, and if you want to deepen, dig into that a little bit deeper, uh, Her by Spike Jones is quite a good film. I don't know if I've seen that. Can you can you tell me a little bit about that one? Um, basically, might, there, there is a, a whole bunch like that, right? Yeah, uh, a personal uh, assistant. Um, I guess I don't know if it gains sentience or at least um, some high level cognition. Okay. Um, maybe um, some. Uh, modicum of rationality um and the main human character in the story falls in love with this um ai for a better for lack of a better term because i feel like ai is not quite it's it's greater than what we would call ai nowadays so Um, so he falls in love with yes and and vice versa that's interesting how what i don't want to get too bogged down on this Mm -hmm. but what evidence do we have or like what what conveys it to the viewer that the AI is in love with him? Um, I guess she does things for him outside of what would one assume to uh, have a virtual assistant. Uh, for example, um, I don't, she definitely personally professes her love for him. Um, and... I don't know if I'm like conflating my AI uh, movie (laughs) tropes together, but I I feel like there's one point in time where um, she gets a uh, intermediary to be a oh a sexual intermediary because she has no body. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, she could like order him flowers or stuff too, right? You know, right? Sure, sure. Could replay it if he's into that. (laughs) Yes. I mean, that's. I mean, this is. I think this is. A, this is a topic we're gonna have to pick up and do like a whole show on sometime. Like, could oh. could an AI be said to have attachments or emotions or stuff like that? You know. 
Yeah. And so with uh, talking about like recognition, we're talking about um, this, this point of like actual mutual recognition, not, not looking at people as their, the stereotypes or, or what you want them to be um, and uh, only there for your own ends. Yeah. Um, now I'm getting a little bit uh, Kantian here, um, but uh, to actually see someone as they are uh, to, you know, see them as as a fully recognized person with their own wants and needs and desires that uh can't be just bent to one's will. Yeah, and that that is it sounds easy to say but that's difficult to do in real life. I mean Sartre in his book Being and Nothingness never gets the reader to the point where that I would say, becomes a live option. Simone de Beauvoir does in her Ethics of Ambiguity. And Sartre brings up this guy, um, Georg Willem Friedrich Hegel, that people know about mostly, I think, because of um, either the, you know, the, the references to the master-slave dialectic or the mistaken idea of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, which is not, not Hegel directly, but is like uh, summaries of him. But Hegel talked a lot about recognition. As a matter of fact, in his first early main work, The Phenomenology of Spirit, the whole dialectic is driven by the Hunger, he says, but in German, begierde, which can mean desire for recognition. And another way that you can translate the word that he uses for recognition um, is acknowledgement. It, it actually comes from the word um, to know, kennen, honor kennen, and and you know the kind of knowledge that we're talking about is like you know I know you because we've hung out together and we've exchanged jokes and anecdotes and all sorts of things other than just like raw data with each other you know we've <laughs> we've gotten to know each other um recognition so includes that kind of like familiarity but it also in involves seeing the other person as as a person and and not just seeing but also um thinking about them that way um choosing the things that you do in that way talking about the other person as a person talking to them as a person and action in in relation to them and these i mean these can all be connected to how we you know when we have that metaphor how i see you you know that mm -hmm. that's a metaphor right but maybe how i see you is also how i hear you and how i uh, talk to you and how I how I relate to you and things like that, right? Uh, and and, and hey, oh, go ahead. I think it really comes down to this idea of like we have such a limited a way to fully understand another person, even people that are as close to us as a spouse. That yeah. it takes constant um, your communication in order to even approach what it is to know them. And a lot of times you'll see that relationships or marriages fail due to this idea of one person having an idea of what their spouse is and their spouse not actually being that thing and them uh, dealing with the uh, incongruity between the uh, the idea of that person and the reality of that person. Yeah. And, you know, you see like, you know, oh, I can fix him type thing or like, oh, well, that's not that's not my husband or that's not my wife they would never do that um right yeah. and um because they have this idea that is not you know totally in congruence with reality and until we are like have some sort of Vul vulcan mind meld um it's going to be really hard to get anywhere close to that you know and there's there's two other things to say about that i think those are some great points one is that sometimes you you do get to know who the person is and realizing who and what they are means that you you can't continue being with them and and you know if you're already in a relationship with them there's you know whether you want to call it like the sunk cost fallacy or you know the idea that you want to hope that the person is going to improve you know if if you if for example so i i had a a fiance this is a long long time ago like a lifetime ago 
And she was constantly running people down, you know, she would, everybody, she'd have something bad to say about them. And I would often like kind of brush it off and I'd be like, people would be like, she's kind of mean. And I'd be like, no, no, you just got to understand her better. She's actually quite nice and stuff like that. And there came a point in time where I did something that like brought these things out to the fore. I, I stopped agreeing with her. And I just said, no, that person isn't the way that you're describing them. Within a week, she gave me the ring back. We were living together and she moved out back to her parents' place because she didn't like having somebody who would go along, who wouldn't go along with her, you know, uh, need to criticize or something like that, you know. And so I think so, there may be things, it's different things for different people, right? Um, there, there's probably, for each of us, there's there's somebody out there who would find the way that we are objectionable. You know, I mean, I got told I think too much, you know, by by people who I was dating in the past. I imagine that you may have heard that as well. You know, that's a deal breaker for some people, right? And so it, it can be like the incongruity between what you hope and what they actually are, and then there's like the realizing what they actually are, and that it ain't gonna change. You know, or it, it's it's not likely to get better. The other thing too, I think that's important to point out is um, none of us truly know ourselves the way that we'd like to portray ourselves as knowing ourselves. Meaning that, you know, we discover stuff about ourselves over time, especially as we get put into new situations or we, we get no, more, you know, knowledge and expertise or, um, we have certain experiences. You know, we, we can become foreign to ourselves and, you know, you, you can find yourself doing things. You're like, I don't think I'm that kind of person. And they can say, well, if you're not that kind of person, why'd you just go and do that thing? <laughs> right. So, yeah. So, uh, with this idea of like recognition and identity kind of at the forefront, I would like to try to, you know, connect this uh, from this idea of the gaze to being seen um, as a subject and then trying to find one's identity um, in yeah. the recognition the, or the failed recognition um, or the, the trying to fit yourself into what the other assumes for you. Um, yeah, in yeah. creating that, um, that identity. And you can find these identities through, um, your friends, from like national identities, from causes that you take up, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, from lovers or yourselves. And there's probably more there as well. I know there are, but I don't want to go too far into that. Um, and so like, potentially there's this idea of like identity as friends. And we have, you know, a, bring out a granddaddy over here, Aristotle, and it talks about like what it is to live a good life. Um, and one of those things he says is it's required to have some good friends. But he says there are many different types of friends, but only one type is really actually good and beneficial for you um, to actually achieve this idea of the good life. And so you have, you know, either friends of convenience, those people that kind of like work with or they're, they're close by, you know, there's convenient to have. Like a lot mm -hmm. of your friends in um, elementary school are probably friends of convenience because they're just, you know, there all the time. You've got your uh, uh, friends of pleasure, those people that you like to go and spend, have a good time with. Um, you have your uh, bad friends. These are the, the friends that, um, are friends of usefulness and they're, they're only your friends because they can provide you something else. And so, um, like if you're only friends with like this, uh, one guy who has, you know, Packers tickets, um, and he'll give you a Packers yeah, that, ticket. That's a good example. <laughs> I, you know, when I, when I teach that material to my students, I'm kind of laughing a little bit because I, I talk about how, when we were kids and we were pretty bad kids, I think in a lot of respects, there would be like one kid usually, and they'd be like, you know, a richer kid, and they'd have like all the cool toys. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this is back before video games and the internet, you know, it'd be like, I don't know, like Micronauts or something like that, like, or the star, they'd have all the Star Wars action figures and they'd let mm -hmm. you play with them. And you wouldn't like this kid at all, but everybody would go to their house and hang out with them so they could play with their toys. Were those toys taken out of the equation, nobody would hang out with that kid, you know? And, yeah. and so 
yeah, there's there's a <laughs> lot of examples like that, I think. Yeah. And so, like, you can create, like, a identity, at least in reference to other people and the recognition that they give you um, from that relationship. Uh, but if it's not actually from this kind of this idea of the good, the virtuous friend, the one that um, sees you as another person, you know, it actually does the, the good recognition or the, at least the closest, the closer form of that, if we can't actually get to peer recognition. Um, yeah. And that what's the best for you as you and not like just as means for you to gain something further. Yeah. And Aristotle isn't saying, by the way, that we shouldn't, we should make all of our relationships be these, you know, totally deep, virtuous things. He says you can only do that with a few people and you, you should have some friends that you and you just have a good time with. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there's nothing wrong about having relationships of convenience or usefulness provided you recognize that those are that. I think – didn't we do an episode discussing this a, a long time ago? Um, does uh, it, this seems to ring a bell. You know? I, I don't know if we did it directly on this, but I think we've definitely spoken about this yeah. from time to time. I mean, Aristotle's big worry is that we mistake relationships that are not really deep relationships for those. And so mm -hmm. we get suckered into staying in a relationship longer than, than we ought to, you know. Um, or we, we extend. enter Mark Zuckerberg in Facebook. <laughs> oh, you mean like us staying on Facebook or uh, no, just the whole idea of, of Facebook and they use the terminology of friends. Oh, right. Yeah. That's... Which is, which is probably even less than most of these, uh, definitions of kind of mediocre friendships. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a great point. Um, I don't know. I'll admit, I don't know who some of my Facebook friends are. They're people who friend requested me and they were a friend of a friend and I said, okay. And I've never actually interacted with them. <laughs> I think Aristotle uh, wouldn't like that probably. No, but I think it's, you know, we have a desire for friends and they just use that as marketing. So picking that particular word instead of like Twitter, you have followers, LinkedIn, you have connections. Um, I don't know what it is on Instagram because I don't do Instagram, but must be something uh, similar. Uh, Graham crackers? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, could, could be. <laughs> so I mean, uh, friend, friendships, though, offer us a way to gradually make sense of our identity. Like, you know, friends can call yeah. us out on our BS when we're – we're following certain aspects of our identity too much. You know, the, the friends are a gaze if we want to talk about this, right? We, we right. worry about how we would appear to the friends that we actually care about. And that might be actually a good way to decide who your real friends are. Do you care if you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing? Who, who do you care finds out about it? If you don't care right. whether somebody finds out about it, you're probably not really friends, right? Right. Or like you might have friends or I guess acquaintances that um, you don't care if they they find out, even though you call them friends. But uh, but then you have other friends that you would care, and so these are you know two different friends that have like two different like I guess ethical uh, criteria, two and, different modalities. And maybe, you might say, yeah, yeah. Now, do you uh, mean like you do, they, that you don't care and they don't care because you you already know that you're not particularly good people? So they're like, well, that's just the way Greg is because <laughs> because <laughs> they know you well. Uh, yeah, and so I think like the ones that know you well and and hold you to the highest standards are probably the ones that you'd want to cater to most. Yeah, ideally, ideally. Know? Yeah. Um, but maybe a lot of us actually need friendships that are – they don't fit into the Aristotelian thing because they're the friends who know us as the screwed up people that we are and they still love us, you know. Mm. And, and they, you know, they, they won't like let us get away with everything. They'll be like, oh, come on, dude. You shouldn't do that. But they're not going to say, if you do that, our friendship is over, you know. Mm. Yeah. 
You seem a little suspicious. Maybe you don't buy that entirely. Maybe you think fans uh, really should I, call I, each other out. Oh, I think they should call each other out. I don't know if like throwing ultimatums around okay. willy nilly is the best way to go about that. Okay. Um, but maybe maybe this is some guy has done this a lot, and you're like, just nope, can't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I had I I cut friendship ties with a few people like that where you made excuses for them too many times and finally mm-hmm. reached a threshold and you're like that's it you know and then they're always surprised there because i mean why not you've gone along right. with all their bs up until this point why is today the day that you you chose to um break things off yeah right so um talking about identity i would like to move on to yeah. a little bit of, like national identity one, once another place one can place identity is uh from uh w- the identity one can find from a political group and so that's either you know a, a smaller political group within a, a, a larger national one or like the, the the you know political group of like you know being an american or something you, you can gain fulfillment and recognition from others uh by fulfilling the kind of like the the accoutrements, the, the the actions that are uh, expected from one within one of these places. Yeah, like, you know, flying a flag is a great example. You know, we Americans look weird to people overseas, especially Europeans, because we want to, you know, we have flags all over the place, you know. And, mm-hmm. and it, you know, there's this, well, Europeans don't do that, although some Europeans do. But it's interesting. I remember reading a text from – it was around from like maybe 1900, 1910. And it was talking about how the French at that time were like flying flags everywhere. It was by George Sorrell, I think, Reflections on Violence. And um, he was he was he was referencing somebody else. And you saw exactly that same kind of – um, manifestation of patriotism in terms of the flag in a place that nowadays people don't do that sort of thing, you know. And I think mm-hmm. this this changes a lot from um, time to time and culture to culture, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, one of the other like benefits one gets from this is that it imbues that story of the national uh, triumphs. Um, onto the individual, and so now, no, no longer does a person feel, you know, potentially alienated or like small, yeah. um, based on their own abilities or inabilities, but they now are part of this larger group, and they've like gained this, uh, you know, this armor and this history of things that they didn't actually personally accomplish but yeah. because they're part of the group um they it gets kind of imbued or like uh, bestowed upon them maybe as a, a a shroud yeah and i think um there's a reinforcing function to the group because if if you were going to do that with just some some person on the street maybe they wouldn't buy your your shtick, right? But if you do it with somebody that you know is part of that group, they'll be like, "Hell yeah, man! That's that's exactly what you know we we think or what we ought to do." You know, um, mm-hmm. there's there's a lot of you know there's a lot of identifiers in terms of what you wear or um, what catchphrases you use or mm-hmm. um, like what you drive or don't drive. This or reminds me of like the whole idea of like stolen honor. Uh, oh, and so, like, if someone's wearing like uh, some sort of military uniform or medals, which they did not actually earn, yeah. there's this idea of like, oh, you are projecting out that you are either part of some organization and or uh, achieve certain things, but you are also, um, but you actually didn't do that. Um, yeah. So you're trying to get all the honor without actually having done the things that required you to get it, um, and. And you see, uh, like you know, this is like something really big with like military, but it, sometimes um, it it comes to People other do cultures this with, and, with educational institutions too. Oh, I went to Harvard, and you didn't actually go to Harvard, right? Because Harvard's yeah. supposed to matter. Um, what were you going to say about other about other? Uh, oh, I was it's, you know, the the idea of like uh, the first one that comes to mind is like. Um, a, uh, a headdress, a, you know, like a Native American headdress, mm, yeah, and, and yeah. most of the times these actually have strong meaning, the, the, the based upon the design, and they're only actually given to people of um, high position within their particular tribe. And you know, yeah. the very same thing is here is happening is that you're saying you're outwardly projecting that you have some sort of uh, 
honor bestowed upon you that you have not actually done. Yeah, going back to the stolen valor thing, I'll, I'll point out one other aspect about it, which is that you never see somebody doing stolen valor and having just like, you know, private first class on their uniform with mm-hmm. just a few medals or something like that. They're always like claiming that they were, you know, an airborne ranger and a green beret and a Navy SEAL and, a, you know, it's all this. And they, you know, maybe served in the French Foreign Legion for a while. It's always got to be this really hyperbolic nonsense. And that's part of how they get caught out because most vets have not. You know, first of all, most vets actually don't want to talk that much about what they did, you know, Mm -hmm. because they're they're if they if they actually got into some real combat, they're still processing it and and it's not really that cool unless they're psychopaths. And then, um, you know, most people haven't done all that much and they certainly didn't belong to all these, you know, elite institutions where you have to qualify for things and um and so they people who do stolen valor most of the time they get caught out super super fast you know um and and you actually ask yourself why are they so dumb as to think they'll get away with it (laughs) (laughs) i don't have an answer to that but it is something that has perplexed me at at times but you know, going back to this idea of like national identity, the the, the yeah, yeah. potential problems, the downsides of this is that once you are part of this group, um, you might be um, influenced to doing things that you wouldn't do yourself because you want to maintain this idea of this identity with this group. Yeah, and so uh, your uh, continued membership might even be dependent upon doing well in the group. You have to be. You have become an object and are only recognized if you perform that which is expected of you. You become misrecognized if you ever desire something the group does not. Yeah, so you can have a real discordance between like your genuine self, who if anybody in the group knew, maybe they wouldn't let you be in the group, and then the mm-hmm. the forward-facing self that you have to keep on enacting even though it's more and more of a mask, you know? Right. So uh, we we spoke about this a little bit earlier, about the uh, identity through love, and we talked about how our relationships can change and how we as individuals change over time, and we have to make sure um, if we actually want a good, strong relationship, the, the communication needs to be high, otherwise you are going to uh, strongly or misrecognize your uh, partner. Yeah. And this is something I can tell you from, you know, being married. Um, people enter into marriages at, you know, one, one stage or one age in their life. And they're saying, well, we're going to be together for a long time. And you get to figure out in part, I mean, nobody knows exactly who they are when they, when they get married, whether they're getting married, you know, as like high school sweethearts or whether they're getting married as, as I did with Andy, uh, in our early forties, you still don't quite know exactly who you are. And, and that has to be revealed over time in the course of being with the person and facing challenges and, um, making decisions and, and things like that. And so you, you might be, um, you might have misrecognized yourself or you might have misrecognized the other person or they might have misrecognized themselves going in. And then there's this process of like adjustment and, you know, you can hold the person to what you thought they were. And then that's a great way to like make sure your marriage is going to fail. You know, if you say, <laughs> well, you, you know, the, the day that we got married, you were like this and this and this. Boy, if you if you do try to do that over ten years or twenty years, you're really setting yourself up for for failure. There has to be a way of like growing. So recognition has to be, let's say, it has to be a, a dynamic thing that that readjusts over time, and 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 responds to how people deal with life crises. You know, a parent dies, um, <laughs> a child um, gets in trouble and has to be, you know. Uh, bailed out of uh, some some issue, um, you know, uh, people lose jobs. Those are the things I think where we get to see different sides of ourselves and mm-hmm. figure figure out who we actually are. Yeah, to just the process of loving is to mm. a certain extent this giving into the realization of what the person that you're loving is. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, so now, as we talk about, like, you know, marriage that is based on mutual recognition of the person for themselves first and not of the idea of the person at the start of the relationship has long legs. Yeah. Um, I was just laughing because I was, I was thinking of something that for a lot of people here in Wisconsin could be a bit of a deal breaker. So I am both a Packers and a Bears fan. Now, oh. I, I root for the, the Packers over the Bears when they play the Bears, but I also like to see the Bears doing well because I grew up in a um, household of people who had moved here to Wisconsin from Chicago. So we had like, you know, Packers Cups and Bears Cups, and we, we would watch them both. And I have a strong emotional attachment. Most of my family actually are still Bears fans because they live in Indiana or Chicago or other parts of Illinois. And... My wife didn't know this when we got married. And, you know, she's a very rational person. Mm-hmm. But this kind of stuck in her craw for a bit. <laughs> it, took, it took a while to, to become, you know, okay with it. Um, I, you know, I, I think she's, she's cool with it now. Um, I mean, I wouldn't like wear a bear's shirt in the house, but, mm. um, you know, uh, now, so, for some people, that might have been a deal breaker. They might have, might have been like, "I, I just can't deal with this," you know. Um, but I feel like I need to like uh, reassess my friendship with you, Greg. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm trying to take this in. I'm trying to recognize you more fully <laughs> for the, the person that you are. And the choices this is taking I make. a bit. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, um, yes. You, you can't choose the family that you grew up with and the 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 teams that they happen to root for well i mean you <laughs> could you could change your your team what do we call it allegiance loyalty yeah um, i mean many people did so you know i'm i'm a bit older than you um in in the the time when the packers just sucked they were terrible <laughs> in the 70s and, and the early 80s Sometimes you'd see more blue and silver here in Wisconsin than you'd see green and gold because there were a lot of mm. fair weather fans, right? And they mm-hmm. and the Cowboys were America's team at the time, so a lot of Cowboys fans uh, who would actually root it for the Cowboys against Green Bay when when uh, I remember, you know, that mm. our, our time wandering in the wilderness. So I and mean, there is an element of choice involved, I think, right? right? I mean, you didn't have the choice of what family you grew up with. True, and who yeah. they tr- uh, you know, yes, you can change, but like you know, uh, fandoms run deep, especially once you're exposed to them uh, from a very early age. Yeah. Hey, we better. Um, I think we better cut to our practice. Um, yes. That we didn't get to last time. Yeah, this was your practice. So would you? Yeah. So I mean, there can be a lot of anxiety provoked by realizing that you are stuck in the gaze of other people. And and a lot of people feel this. And one of the things that you can do is realize that the other person who's gazing is not just a subject who's catching you in their gaze and objectifying you and judging you. They're also caught up in the same sorts of dynamics, even if they might be in a you know, higher power differential than you or be acting in ways hostile to or controlling of you. And, and if you do this, it can be, it takes a little bit of reinforcement. It can take away some of the power that they seem to have because the power isn't actually on their side. You're giving them that power. You're being provoked or tricked or, or led to give them that power of the gaze and you can take it away. Um, taking it away, you want to you want to lead us out on our final thoughts? Today we leave you with the words of Jean-Paul Sartre. It is a shame or pride which reveals to me the other's look and myself at the end of that look. It is the shame or pride which makes me live, not now, the situation of being looked at. <laughs> <laughs>